let's uh, pretend that you have a, a kind of mid sixties uh, woman presenting to you. Um, she's gone through menopause. Her LDL cholesterol has bumped up significantly. She noticed this increase. It's at 120 milligrams per deciliter. Her physician has recommended that she's come to see you. Um, she does have a coronary artery calcium score. It was zero. She hasn't measured ApoB. She has no history of events, but she's wondering if she needs to be concerned about this elevated LDL cholesterol um, that has been a kind of more recent thing that she's she's noticed. Well, on the surface, she seems to be at relatively low short-term risk and probably not at much long-term risk for cardiovascular disease either. I want to make sure that her blood pressure is good, that she's not a smoker, um, that she doesn't have any other health problems, that like secondary factors that may be masking risk in, in her, the so, so-called risk enhancing factors like history of inflammatory diseases or history of you know, pregnancy related complications. That I think I, um, you know, the list goes on, but I, I do want to know some other features of her metabolic status. I want to make sure that there's no signs of insulin resistance in her. Um, and I want to measure her ApoB and her lipoprotein little a, but if she says, doc, please don't do anything that's going to cost me any more, more money than I need to spend. I think I, I have a, I'll have a pretty high degree of certainty that she appears to be at low short-term risk. Because even if she has a high ApoB or, or high LP little a, uh, disproportionate to what you'd expect based upon what you've, we've heard so far, her calcium score is still zero and her short-term risk is going to be low at age 65. So if even if I find that she has some other feature that suggests that we're underestimating her risk, I don't think we're going to be underestimating it by much. And the the National Lipid Association um, evaluated the potency of risk markers. Um, I'm trying to think it was now, I think it was around 2011. I know it seems like a long time ago, but the reason we haven't done it again since then is because there hasn't been any data that suggested something different at play. In When you look at all of these risk markers together, the one that changes the risk strata significantly is coronary artery calcium score. ApoB, LPA, HSCRP, um, carotid IMT, they didn't really push the needle that much in, the, in terms of estimating risk. And the, way you're, the thing that's going to be most influential in estimating this person's risk with these features is at age 65, a coronary artery calcium score of zero, is favorable. I'd have to look up on the Cax Mesa database how many women the same age have a calcium score of zero, but I, I, I would guess it's it's upwards of 65, 75% without looking at that table. What if we kind of modify this case study a little bit now? Um, she doesn't have a coronary artery calcium score and you order one and it comes back with showing that she has calcification at what amount of calcification would then kind of warrant the conversation around lowering that LDL cholesterol? That's easy. So at 65 years old and no other risk factors for coronary artery disease, and, and she has calcified plaque in her coronary arteries, she should be on pharmacologic therapy to lower her LDL cholesterol. And I would I would probably tell her, you know, depending on the the amount of plaque that was recognized by that test, that an LDL cholesterol, it, once we've achieved an LDL cholesterol less than 70 milligrams per deciliter, we don't, we probably don't need to keep adding more therapy, but that would be a, a range that we'd like to see for somebody who has calcified plaque at that age. If the calcium score was greater than a hundred, um, remember I was mentioning about the aspirin therapy, at least one analysis suggested that that's a reasonable threshold for determining aspirin therapy and somebody at low risk for bleeding from aspirin. So a healthy 65-year-old woman, I would f I'd feel pretty confident you could safely give her aspirin if she has a calcium score that's greater than 100. Um, and, um, you know, if her calcium score is greater than 300, which is a very high score, now we're talking about a risk that's more equivalent to what we see in people with established heart disease, especially if the calcium score is greater than 1,000. Now she has a very high plaque burden and the same kind of plaque burden that we see in people who were in 
the you know the Fourier trial where they have established cardiovascular disease it's stable and who are already on high intensity statin they benefited from additional therapy with PCSK9 inhibitor in, inhibitor on top of the high intensity statin so I would treat her the same way if if and and that's how I would use the calcium score to stratify her risk and going back to the early part of the conversation you would order ApoB to see if they were concordant? Yeah, I'd be curious to know in her case, but I, either way, I, I've already decided to treat her. So I, I can't imagine in that scenario that an ApoB is going to dissuade me from wanting you know, right. to treat her with therapy. Let's finish off with the table in your consensus paper that went over the, the treatment thresholds. I thought that was interesting. So you had, uh, I'll let you kind of explain I guess what the purpose of that table was. I, when I read it, I thought this could be particularly helpful for the clinician that might be listening. Well, remember we were talking about how we formulated these levels of ApoB that were considered to be equivalent to LDL cholesterol based upon the clinical trial data that we had. We had the NHANES study for our untreated individuals who are over age 18. And then we had, we looked at data from the Improve It trial and the Fourier trial in people who were treated. We felt that the untreated population really didn't need spe specific call out for ApoB equivalency, that you can estimate risk and base your decisions using the common standards that are available. But we formulated these levels in people who were expected to be treated. Because we have these are there are existing thresholds for LDL cholesterol to intensify treatment. So right now we categorize risk in people based upon um, the presence of cardiovascular disease and other features that accelerate cardiovascular disease. And there's three categories that we thought were important. There's people who are categorized as having very high risk. And, and by the way, these were not our designations. These were already existing from guidelines and the more recent ACC expert consensus decision pathway on non-statin therapy. But these three categories of people with established ASCVD at very high risk, people with established ASCVD at, at um, high risk or also known as not very high risk, and then people with more intermediate risk. And so those are people usually who don't have established ASCVD. So based upon guidelines, we have three LDL cholesterol thresholds that tell us that if your level's above that, we should do more. And those thresholds for the three groups corresponds to 55 milligrams per deciliter, 70 milligrams per deciliter, and 100 milligrams per deciliter for LDL. When we looked at the data and compared ApoB, we came up with numbers that were actually pretty similar but not identical. And based upon our assessment of the data, we thought that we should use numbers that look that were the following, 60, 70, and 90 milligrams per deciliter for ApoB. So, so if, someone is, those if someone is considered very high risk yeah. and their ApoB is over 60 milligrams per deciliter, that would be a, an indication to commence treatment to get them under to 60. intensify treatment to intensify treatment yeah. sorry because they're very high risk so they're already on they're already yeah. on it if they were high risk then it would be an apob of 70 milligrams per deciliter to intensify treatment again and then if they were borderline or intermediate risk 90 milligrams per deciliter yeah those are the levels at which you would say okay we we should dial up tr uh, lipid lowering therapy for this patient yeah okay and, you know, we talked about uh, the Anne-Marie Navarre paper that came out around the same time, and they looked at similar data, and they may have taken a more practical approach to this, which is they saw that the ApoB and LDL cholesterol numbers in terms of milligrams per deciliter were so similar that they felt comfortable using the exact same numbers, that it was too much for clinicians and patients to have two sets of numbers in mind. And... Um, I applaud them for taking a very practical approach to that because you can see our numbers are not that different. 55 versus 60, 70 versus 70, identical, or 90 versus 100. So I, I think it's not unreasonable to, if the next iteration of the guidelines thinks about this, to consider you know, using the same number. I think that might be a more practical approach. But you know, fidelity to the data, 
we, we chose to use these numbers. When it comes to gut health, I couldn't find a supplement that did it all. So I formulated one with gastroenterologist, Dr. Will Bolsowitz. It's called Daily Microbiome Nutrition or DMN by 38 Terra. And to our knowledge, it is the most complete prebiotic formula on the market today. We built DMN to support a healthy, diverse microbiome, which we now know plays a critical role in everything from digestion to immunity, metabolism, and even brain health. What sets DMN apart is that it contains clinically proven doses of ingredients like actazin and solanol, and it's a very concentrated source of polyphenols, all conveniently combined to nourish your gut bacteria and promote true microbial diversity. No artificial sweeteners, no no gums or fillers, just science-backed, plant-based ingredients in a once-a-day, incredibly delicious drink. So if you're looking to fuel your microbes and enjoy all the benefits that come with that, head to 38terra.com and use the code SIMON for 10% off. That's 38terra.com and use the code SIMON to feed those gut bugs.